muted and take it away, Diana. Thank you so much, Blair. Can you all hear me okay? All right. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit tonight, this evening, about the stigma around mental health concerns. So with anyone who's facing mental health concerns, stigma is one of the biggest hurdles to overcome. In fact, it's the leading reason why up to two-thirds of people living with men mental health illnesses do not seek help. Stigma is defined as negative attitude or prejudice and results in discrimination. So it means thinking less of a person because of their condition. And this results in people feeling unwanted and feeling ashamed. And it adds to the suffering caused by mental illness. So the World Health Organization calls stigma the hidden burden of mental illness. It's that part that we don't talk about, that we don't even want to talk about, but it's very real and it's really important. And I'm really grateful that this was the start of our conversation tonight. In a recent study, only 50% of Canadians indicated that they would tell their friends or their coworkers that they have a family member that suffers from mental illness. Compare that to 72% who would discuss a diagnosis of cancer and 68% who would talk about a family member having had diabetes. So it's still one of those things that people just don't want to talk about. And the experience stigma, the research shows 56% of the time from their family, 52% of the time from their friends, 44% of the time from their doctors and other healthcare professionals, and 30% of the time from work. And according to the Mental Health Commissions in Canada, on any given week, more than 500,000 Canadians are unable to go to work due to mental health problems. And yet people come up with excuses because they don't want to share the truth. But things are starting to change. So in 2012, only 42% of Canadians said that they were comfortable speaking about mental health. In 2019, it's increased to 84%. And I think there's been some really great leadership, one of the big ones from the Bell Let's Talk movement that has made this a conversation that we can no longer ignore, that we can no longer suppress, that we can no longer judge, that we need to step up and share this conversation and be okay with it. And when it comes to mental health, helping to end the stigma allows people to access services so people don't get supports and services because of the stigma that's associated with it and angela told you one out of five canadians will experience a mental health issue in any given year so how do we overcome the stigma to ensure that everyone who needs help knows that it's safe for them to get help and that it's important for them to get help and that when they get help they can go from barely surviving to where they can thrive in their lives. So there's some strategies that help reduce the stigma around mental health issues. The first one is education. Know the facts about mental health. So there's a lot of research out there, there's a lot of information out there, but know where your sources come from. Make sure that they're credible, credible sources and that you're not getting misinformation. Recognizing that mental health is not a choice. Mental health illness is not a choice. Nobody would choose this given the opportunity to be different or to experience life in a different way. And my belief is that we all are light beings, soul beings having a human experience. And as part of that, we all have this tendency to want to just feel really good in life and to reach for the light. But what if we acknowledge that the darkness and the shadows is part of this embodied experience? It's part of being human. And, it, and we didn't try to make it wrong. We saw it as just a different part that we need to navigate in our lives instead of making it something that we need to um, push away and resist. So by pushing it away and resisting it, we deny its existence and then we stop having conversations about it. But instead, if we could show up and just let people know, you know, yeah, I'm not in a good place right now. And find out how we can help others in it, the educational piece. The other part that's really critical is changing the language. And I've been uh, practicing as a communication specialist, speech and language pathologist for over 30 years with my specialty primarily in the area of ASD, of autism. And I've learned in the work and the field that I am that the words that we use matters significantly. That words can really empower people and words can take away power from people. So in my field as a communication specialist, it's really important that we do not label with the identification. So I don't say I am depressed. 
In other words, I'm labeling myself as that. I say I feel depressed or I'm managing depression or I'm moving through waves of depression. So if you can see the difference there, it's about not identifying yourself or your loved ones with the, the disability or the identification or whatever you're going through. It's recognizing that this is just part of what happens in life perhaps and we can move through it as we move through anything in life. There's going to be ebbs and flows, waves and low points in life. But as soon as we identify with the identification or with the diagnosis, we stop realizing that there's other parts of us that are so valuable, that are so beautiful, that are so needed to be shared and experienced and expressed in the world because we get really stuck on the identification. The other thing is, um, as an example, using the word, um, my neighbor, oh, that's my neighbor, he has bipolar, or that's my bipolar neighbor, instead of that's my neighbor, and he sometimes acts a little bit unpredictable because he's managing bipolar disorder. So it's not that we're not admitting to the truth, but it's a different way of communicating it that is much more uplifting for the individual who's dealing with mental health issues and or any identification, because my field has really been um, working with children who have had identifications. One of the third points I wanted to mention is to remember that you are not your diagnosis. So we don't use labels to identify with the labels and we're not our diagnosis. We're not the experiences that have happened to us. We have experiences in our life. So we are not our mental health concern or mental health illness. We have mental health concerns or mental health illness. And I hope you can see that difference. Another way of recognizing that when you see that you are not the circumstances or the situations that you're going through or that you've gone through in your life, when you can let go of that identification, you can come back to realizing that we're all children of God, whatever the God of your understanding is, and we're all miracles. There's a one in over, depending on the research that you read, over one in 50 billion chances that any one of us would be here today. In other words, like alive and breathing and well that there are odds of us being here, of us ever being born and being here and being in a situation where not only are we miracles physically, but we have this capacity to be able to access learning, community and support online. Like we're extremely blessed and abundant that we have computers or phones or whatever you're accessing this webinar on and a community that's here to support you, to support me, to support each other, because I'm not the expert. I believe so strongly that I am you cleverly disguised as me. I've just a bit of a nerd when it comes to health and wellness, and I've spent the last 20 years researching, coaching, doing, bringing mindfulness into all of the practices and all of the hats that I wear. And through that was able to heal my own limiting beliefs about myself. So I have a power quote that's in my last book, and it's, it goes like this, that our experiences do not define us. Our experiences do not define us. They inform us and they have the potential to catapult us into our greatest purpose. That I believe that we all have a purpose here on earth. And if we limit ourselves with our identification, if we get caught up in the stigma of the identification or the diagnosis or whatever it is that any one of us is dealing with, we forget that we have a greater purpose in our world. There was a time about eight years ago where I was in a very deep depression. I lost everything. And I still get very teary and tingly when I talk about this. It's a very vulnerable moment and share for me. But I lost everything. I lost four businesses, a house, my investment properties, my vehicles, and my retirement fund. And it was really hard for me to get out of bed someday. And it was really critical for me those days to reach out to people, to reach out to therapists. And I also reached out to coaches and the therapist had a role in my life and the coaches had a, a kind of different role. And there was overlap at times. And I don't know that I could have gotten out of bed without their support. What I knew for sure is that my philosophy, my beliefs and my teachings are that, and I knew this even in that moment, that my experiences do not define me. And that there's ebb and flow in the yogic world, we call it um, spanda, that everything moves in ebbs and flows. So if there's going to be a high in life, there's also going to be a low. And if I only attach to the high, in other words, if I only want to feel good all the time, when I don't feel good, I'm going to make something wrong about myself. 
So instead I move in the wave now and in the yogic world, I call it, I get on my surfboard and I ride the waves of life. And sometimes the waves are going to be smooth and sometimes the waves are going to be bumpy and life is going to be bumpy. And in each of those situations, whatever the bumps are, whether they're high or whether they're low, I don't let them define me. I let them inform me. I let them teach me. I let them uh, place me in a place of curiosity, like, what can I learn from this? Right? Who can I talk to about this? How can I use this to help other people? Because that's absolutely my purpose here in the world. I have no doubt about it. I've also learned um, to move from a slightly different approach than a traditional counseling or therapeutic approach where I move from the bottom up instead of top down when I do coaching and when I do my mindfulness work. So it's not about changing mindset so much, although I do some of that traditional life skill mindset changing. It's about recognizing that we hold trauma, tension, and experiences in our bodies. We hold them in our bodies and we literally kink our nervous system. It's like, we, it's like a hose that gets kinked. And when the hose is kinked, when our nervous system is kinked, in other words, we have trauma that we haven't been able to manage, to work through, to give voice to, to express or to heal, we minimize, we diminish our life force. And so I say, of course, people feel depressed. Depression is lack of feeling because feeling means I have to feel in my body what's not feeling really good. And so people often go and they want to do cognitive therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, just tell me how to change my thoughts. My work is about moving into the body and, and creating a safe environment where people can feel safe enough in their own bodies to be able to move in and just start to unkink little by little, bit by bit, the nervous system so that they can start to heal and feel their wholeness and completeness, which is absolutely every one of our birthright. Another key point to help support people around letting go of the stigma is to be empathic. Empathy is so critical. Dr. Brene Brown is a researcher, social worker. Most people have heard about Brene Brown. She's like, I, I call her my best friend. We've actually never met, but we just speak the same language. And Brene Brown says that if you put shame in a Petri dish, it needs three things to grow. It needs secrecy, it needs silence, and it needs judgment. If you put that same shame in a Petri dish and you douse it with empathy, it will survive. And as I talk last night, <laughs> I was given the best experience uh, to share with you. So I'm in BC right now visiting a family member, my sister, who has a son, eight years old, who has fetal alcohol syndrome disorder. He was adopted and he has FASD. And for those of you who don't know much about FASD, it shows up as a lot of regulatory issues. Self-regulation is a, man, a massive, um, difficult area for him. And he had a little meltdown yesterday at bedtime. And my sister was with him for about an hour and she's amazing. She's a psychologist. She knows exactly what to do. And when she came out, my 13 year old said to her, I'm sorry that you had a hard time tonight. And I just said, this is my son. I said, thank you so much for sharing that because that's empathy. That's like, I see that this is hard and I don't need to fix it. There's really nothing I can say to fix it, but I can acknowledge the effort that you're putting in and how difficult it is. And the next morning, I said to my, my nephew, uh, this morning, the next day, I said to my nephew, I'm sorry, you had a hard time getting to bed last night. I could see that was tough for you. I don't need to make it different. I don't need to fix it. Empathy is being present and recognizing that we can offer compassion we can be with the people, whoever, whatever the situation is, we can be with them. So empathy is so critical to be able to help to reduce the stigma around mental health issues. And it could be as simple as just asking, how can I help? How can I be there with you? I know that you guys have shared some of your recent seasons that have been really tough. I've had some really tough seasons. I lost my father to COVID. And my daughter, who's 23, one day I just sat in my bedroom floor and cried. And she came, and because my kids are coached every day, she knew exactly what to do. She just sat next to me. That's all she did. She sat next to me. She didn't have to fix it. She didn't have to say, it's going to be okay, mom, because you know what? It wasn't okay in that moment. I needed empathy, and that's what she brought to me. And then the last point I wanted to talk about was, and this is again from Brene Brown's work, 
and from the work, um, the beautiful work that um, the bell is doing is break the silence, break the silence. One of the reasons that there's so much shame around mental health issues is because people have not talked about it. I mean, really until very recently. And when we talk about it, we start to create a space where shame can no longer be fed. Shame is the reason we don't talk about it and shame gets fed by silence. So the only remedy for shame, and this is from Brene Brown, the remedy for shame is to give it a voice. Talk about it, whatever you're talking about it looks like. So for me, I'm a writer, I'm an author. So I write and my books are very vulnerable. I'm in the process of writing one now and like everything is in there. My daughter looks at it and it says, mom, I have a vulnerability handle for reading how vulnerable your book is and it's not even about her. But writing is a great, a great tool. Journaling is a great tool. And don't ever, um, don't ever underestimate the power of talking. And your talking may not mean that you talk to, you know, your barista at Starbucks, but maybe you do, right? We have this society where we've, we've been taught that when someone says, how are you? There's one response. I'm fine. But my dad just died. I'm not fine. I'm not fine. And I have a, you know, I have a definition for fine that is like effed up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. So if I'm going to use it and my, my students, my, my, my friends, my family know that if I say fine, they know I need support because fine doesn't mean okay in my world. It means I need support. So to be able to share, and it means being willing to go into your body and to feel, okay, what am I noticing right now? For me, I've been feeling a lot of grief. Some of it's mine, some of it's collective grief. Certainly at the beginning of COVID, I was feeling a grief that wasn't even just mine. It was a universal grief that I just felt so strongly in my body. And it comes through you know, years and years and years of mindfulness work and embodied work and somatic work, moving into the body instead of moving away from the body, moving towards the discomfort instead of moving away from this, the discomfort. And, and being able to do that gives you then the opportunity to to curate the language that helps you to recognize what am I feeling? What is happening inside me? And then finding your people, finding your tribe, your community to be able to share what it is that you're noticing inside of you. And if you don't have people, this is where it's so important to find a therapist or find a coach because their job is to listen, is to give you an opportunity to find your voice and to share so that you don't walk around saying, I'm fine but inside you're dying, right? Inside, you've got so much discomfort and tension and tightness that you don't necessarily know what to do with, or the alternative is numbness, right? We just don't feel. So finding someone that you can share a little bit of your inner world with. And then the great thing about that, if it's a friend or a family member, you give them permission to share their inner landscape. And this is how together we start to heal and move through the the stigma that we've placed on mental health and on not speaking about our truths. And I want to end with just um, a quick paragraph where mental health is bigger. It's bigger than the presence or absence of mental health illness. Our mental health is the greatest thing that we can give. We, hold, we, we have this capacity to heal and to hold space for it. But when we have stigma around it and around illnesses, we squish it down. We suppress it. We push it down. Excuse me a second. <coughs> Each of our paths to mental well-being will be unique. All of you on the screen, you have your own goals. You have your own challenges. You have your own talents. You have your own supports. But if we can focus on education, if we can focus on the language that we use, if we can focus on not identifying with our diagnosis, our experiences, our identifications, if we can focus on creating empathy and giving voice to our shame and our experiences, we can work together to ensure that everyone has an access to their voice and access to mental health supports. And we can help to remove the stigma to reduce the, um, the limitations and to, to reduce the stresses that we're carrying in our body because stigma creates more stress. And I'd like to end with a quote that I share at some point all the time in my talks with regards to life, but really specifically here with regards to mental health and mental well-being, we may not have it all together, but together we can have it all. And that's what this community is about. So thank you so much for um, inviting me to be part of this event tonight.
Wow, Diana, thank you so very much. You mm -hmm. speak with such depth of experience and gentleness and kindness about you. And I just love your energy. Um, I'm wondering if you could write in the chat